and I've had a little bit of a change to my title. I'm going to talk today about interannual changes in the predictors of habitat use and distribution of amphibians in the Elkhorn Slough region. Okay. All right, so in the talk, I'm going to go ahead and um, introduce you to the Elkhorn Slough National Estuarine Research Reserve and a little bit about what we do there and our amphibian monitoring project there. I'm also going to talk a little bit about our motivation for expanding our monitoring of amphibians from the reserve to the larger region. And then I'm going to talk about our methods for this regional monitoring and then some of the trends that have come out of our first two years of monitoring. Um, first, I'm going to um, show you the amphibian species we're dealing with there. We focus on the pond breeding amphibian species. Um, Nina gave you a nice introduction to the California red-legged frog and the bullfrog. Um, and then we have um, a nice abundant population of Pacific tree frogs. And we also have some um, western toads and the endangered long-toed salamander in the area. One thing to keep in mind um, during this talk is that um, there's a, something that's significant, significant for um, our study. Um, California red-legged frog um, larvae require just one season for metamorphosis, typically. And so they um, require breeding ponds that stay wet through August, whereas bullfrogs require perennial water. Off. Most of you probably know this, but they require perennial, perennial pools um, for metamorphosis, as they often take more than one year for metamorphosis. And this will become more important in our analysis. So the Elkhorn Slough National um, Estuarine Research Reserve sits along um, Elkhorn Slough here in the, in the red encircled area. And you can see that it's, it's a, it sits in a bit more of this kind of pristine and less altered habitat along the slough. They, we conduct a variety of um, research activities, including estuarine and terrestrial research and our um, amphibian monitoring project. So in 1997, we began monitoring the California red-legged frog populations at the reserve. And here's a, um, a photo um, that outlines our different ponds on the reserve. And um, we monitored eight of these, eight of these ponds um, for the California red-legged frog. And in um, 1997, what we saw um, from our surveys were the greatest weekly maximum counts um, for adults on the reserve were, were about 200. Um, and then in 98, they, they were upward of 300. But after that, we started seeing um, a, a bit of a decline and kind of jumping around at this kind of lower level below around 50 or so um, individuals for a maximum weekly count. So we had some concern about the population. And because we have Santa Cruz long-toed salamanders as well, we were concerned generally about our kind of amphibian species complex and wanted to know um, more about amphibians in the region and um, some more information about guiding our management decisions. So our... Um, we set out um, for our regional monitoring project with several goals. Um, the first was, one was to identify other amphibian species in the larger region outside the reserve and to identify existing threats to these species. Um, and Nina, Nina talked about some of those. Um, and to understand which factors predict site occupancy for these various species. And that would help guide some of our uh, management decisions. So now our scope is uh, much larger than that just small portion of the reserve, but we, we now expanded our scope to the regions just all around, um, all around the slough. And so here's an overview. Again, here's the slough. And these red dots represent the um, pond sites that we monitored. And so you can see that they occur in a variety of habitats, including um, agricultural habitats, um, urbanized areas and upland, um, more pristine habitats. And so the ponds also varied in a number of their characteristics, including size from 20 meters squared to 320,000 meters squared. Um, there, was, there were man-made and um, natural ponds and ephemeral and perennial ponds. So there were a lot of different um, habitat characteristics for us to look at and compare um, in terms of predictors of site occupancy for these species. So 
using aerial photographs and um, knowledge of the area, we were able to identify about 45 ponds in the region, and we were able to gain access to about 40 of them to survey. And we surveyed them in 2004 and 2005, and this um, surveying effort is ongoing. We used the standard nighttime eye shine, um, evening listening, and daytime dip netting um, techniques to get an idea of the amphibian species composition, as well as the um, some some um, as well as getting an idea of how many um, amphibians are relative abundance of amphibians in the ponds. Um, we also collected data on a variety of biotic and abiotic site characteristics, including vegetation, pH, and temperature. And then we were also able to estimate um, a variety of other um, characteristics about the ponds from GIS maps, including isolation, distance from paved roads, and distance from agriculture. Oops. So um, in 2004, we surveyed a total of 38 ponds, and of these ponds, about half of them dried down by August, and so uh, before August, and so um, only half of them were appropriate red-legged frog breeding habitat. Um, so there are 16 ponds that had California red-legged frogs, 16 that had bullfrogs, and then 33 um, were sites where we de detected um, Pacific tree frogs, and only two sites. Um, where we found Santa Cruz long-toed salamanders or western toads. In 2005, it was a much wetter year, and we had 39 sites that we were able to look at, and only four of them dried down before August. Um, as you might expect, there was an increase in the number of bullfrogs and, Cal and um, California red-legged frogs using these ponds, um, uh, an increase in ponds being used, sorry and then um, a decrease in the number of ponds being used by Pacific tree frogs, which is a bit puzzling, but I'll touch on that in a minute. Um, Santa Cruz long-toed salamanders and western toads were still uh, um, using ponds, a uh, few ponds, and so those won't um, occur in our statistical analysis. So we looked at species interactions. In 2005, um, Pacific tree frogs occurred more frequently in ponds that did not have California red-legged frogs or bullfrogs. This wasn't the case in 2004. So um, beckoning back to that difference in number of ponds being used in 2005, and yet it being a wetter year, we suspect what might be going on is that with an increase in ephemeral pools available to Pacific tree frogs in 2005, they may have been taking advantage of sites that didn't have their predators, the California red-legged frog and bullfrogs, um, in order to breed, whereas in 2004, with a um, paucity of sites available, they may have been forced into these sites that are also used by California red-legged frogs and bullfrogs. This would be an interesting thing to um, see as, it, as we continue with our monitoring to see how it develops. In um, both years, California red-legged frogs and bullfrogs were positively correlated, which isn't a surprising finding considering that they have fairly similar habitat um, requirements. Now, of the um, different site characteristics we looked at, um, we've, we found four that were, that were significant in predicting site occupancy, and those were um, pond size, um, distance from roads, ponds remaining wet through August, and proximity to other freshwater sites. So for bullfrogs, in 2004, um, it, uh, large, ponds, uh, large ponds were a significant predictive factor for the presence of bullfrogs, but it wasn't significant in 2005. Again, we suspect this may have something to do with um, the change in rainfall and available habitat. With more habitat available, bullfrogs may have been moving out of some of the larger perennial ponds and using some of the other um, ponds available, but um, that'll be another thing to continue investigating in our, in our ongoing studies. Um, there was only one factor as well with Pacific tree frogs that, pers that predicted site occupancy, and that, were, that was sites that were greater than 50 meters from a road, and that was only significant in 2005. Um, again, this may have something to do with um, more available habitat in, in 2005 and Pacific tree frogs being able to be a bit more picky about the habitat that they were being able to use, but that would be something else we keep our eye on as we continue our studies. Um, interestingly, um, California red-legged frogs had three different factors that predicted site occupancy significantly. Um, the 
um, in 2005, freshwater sites within 100 meters was a significant factor in predicting um, site occupancy. It wasn't significant in 2000. Well, it wasn't. We didn't have enough sites to look at in 2004 that remained wet that were within close proximity. So. Again, it'll be interesting to see how this pans out as we continue our studies. But if it does pan out, it has some interesting management implications. The second factor that predicted site occupancy were ponds that remained wet through August. And this was significant in 2004 and not in 2005. This isn't a surprising finding given their, given their biology. And then finally, sites that were greater than 50 meters um, from a road were, signif were significant in both 2004 and 2005 in predicting site occupancy for these red-legged frogs. Um, and taken together, it's interesting that there were three, um, three factors that predicted site occupancy, occupancy for California red-legged frogs, which are um, declining compared to the more generalist, the more generous um, cohorts who tend to be doing quite a bit better. Um, the Pacific tree frog and the bullfrog only had one um, factor that predicted site occupancy. This may have something to do with Pacific, uh, with um, California red-legged frogs having more habitat requirements and needs and being a bit more sensitive. And it's something to um, to keep our eyes on as we continue studying and maybe may go some way to explain what's going on with these species. So in closing, um, the first two years of our study have already um, have already returned some interesting um, trends and in interannual um, variability in these species. Um, none of our sites that we studied were free of threats, and so this was a um, this was an important thing for us to look at to help us to determine which factors are most important to um, look at when we're trying to conserve these species in terms of uh, guiding our management decisions. Um, our research is ongoing, and we're looking to expand both the number of ponds and the factors we look at, including disease. And we hope to expand monitoring over the next several years, um, and that hopefully will provide a clearer picture of factors that predict site occupancy for these species. And we're looking for partners, so if you're interested in participating and getting involved in any way, let us know. Oops. And finally, um, there's a variety of folks I wanted to acknowledge. Don Rees um, began the monitoring project in 97, and since then we've had numerous wonderful volunteers who have participated um, for land access. We have to thank um, Elkhorn Slough Reserve, Elkhorn Slough Foundation, the Packard Ranch, and many, many private landowners, and for financial and logistical, uh, logistical support, um, Elkhorn Slough, Elkhorn Slough Foundation, NSF, um, participants in the Elk, Elkhorn Slough Amphibian Summits, and um, Daniel Doak, my advisor. Thanks. <laughs>